Welcome to the Cosmic Quest Science Hour. This is Wednesday, August 1st, 2012. I'm Jason Davis. Uh, I'm filling in for Emily Lakdawalla again this week. Uh, for today's show, we're going to be talking about lunar dust. Um, surprisingly, there's still a lot we don't know about the nature of dust on the moon. Uh, in fact, an upcoming NASA miss mission to study the moon's atmosphere, and yes, it does have an atmosphere, a thin one, uh, actually uses the phrase Apollo astronauts in its mission objectives. So to talk to us about this surprisingly fascinating topic is a scientist at the University of Colorado Boulder's Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. He's also the principal investigator at the Colorado Center for Lunar Dust and Atmospheric Studies, which runs a mammoth contraption called the Dust Accelerator. So without further ado, Mihai Horani, thank you and welcome to the CosmoQuest Science Hour. <laughs> Mihai, maybe um, you can tell us a little bit about why lunar dust is so fascinating to study. Uh, so there are lots of issues that one, one might uh, get into trouble not knowing about how difficult it is to, to live and work and run machines and optical devices on the lunar surface. So some of my colleagues had this idea to compare that to to work in a in a coal mine, that <laughs> it, it is just it's just a horrible environment. So there is a lot of issues that are technological and engineering issues that you need to know about how abrasive and how clingy lunar dust is and how quickly it destroys your fine optics and uh, fittings and gears and it is just a bad environment. So that is for our colleagues in engineering and. Uh, and, 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 and astronaut safety issues who are worried about these things. But there is also a lot of nice basic physics of, an, of, a, of, an, of, a, of a surface that has uh, what we call regolith, movable fine dust exposed to plasmas and UV radiation. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of neat basic physics. Can you move it around? Can you charge it? Can you transport it on its own in an environment that there are no no rivers and no big winds as far as, as, as moving things around like it happens on Earth or certainly on Mars as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a different environment. And then if you, if, you, if you look around in the solar system, there's a lot of objects like the moon that are directly exposed to the sun and the solar wind plasma flow. And you would like to know the properties of the surface you would like to know how, how things behave on, on, on these objects. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I found this interesting from a recent presentation that you did, uh, something that I hadn't considered before, that uh, these planetary bodies, uh, airless planetary bodies like the moon, um, are quite common in the solar system, um, much more common than uh, planetary bodies with atmospheres like Earth or Venus. So. Uh, it really behooves us to learn how um, the dust environment there there works, doesn't it? Uh, uh, absolutely so, absolutely so. And actually, there is there is yet another aspect that we have not discussed uh, during your visit here a week ago or so. Mm -hmm. That is, we do know about stuff, small dust particles that come from outside our solar system. Interstellar gas and dust flows through the solar system as we move with respect to the nearby galaxy. So there are these little messengers that if you could actually look at the composition, the chemical isotopic composition, you could actually taste or smell or touch stuff from other stars. So the dust is also a messenger of a lot of things that could happen from far away and, and carry information from far away places. And as we get close to the edge of the solar system and uh, missions like the Voyager spacecraft, for instance, um, are we picking up more of that dust or less of that dust? So that is an incredibly good question. <laughs> and we argue about it for a long time. Voyagers do not carry a dust instrument. They huh. do have plasma wave instruments. And when a dust particle hits the body of the spacecraft, it generates unusual signals that our colleagues in pl who study plasma waves would argue that it is dust. And so it appears that at least for a while we, we we have seen a slight increase in those type of signals, but it's we don't know how to calibrate the whole spacecraft as a dust detector. It's kind of hard. It never happened. 
But the good news is that New Horizons, on its way to Pluto, does carry a dust instrument. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud because that's a dust instrument that was built by students here at the University of Colorado. And that will hopefully work for many, many years, way past Pluto, into what we call the Kuiper Belt, mm -hmm. and see w how m at least the fine, the small end of the, of the collisional debris that is produced by collisions between Kuiper Belt objects. And also because the incoming interstellar dust hits the surface of these objects and generates secondary particles. Mm -hmm. So we, we, will, we will have a good understanding of the dust production rates uh, on, uh, in the Kuiper Belt. And that is interesting for many reasons. W one possibility, of course, is uh, if we fly through the Kuiper Belt, we might see, of course, the imprint of big objects. Like when you look at disks, dust disks around other stars, it's easy to detect, not easy, but people can detect Jupiter-sized object close to the central star because then the period is short enough and the, the, the toggle, the, the, the push and pull on the central object is big enough. Or maybe the blimp as it passes in front and behind the star is big enough to notice planets. But the disks themselves would also act as a big dust detector because the gravitational interaction between the disk and the planet makes an imprint. The dust distribution is not uniform. And we would like to argue that that imprint is certainly a telltale sign of much smaller objects with much longer periods that we could detect these days. But then you would ask, so I do know that we do have a planet, planets, <laughs> nine or ten or who knows how many, if you count all the small <laughs> objects in the Kuiper Belt. Right, right. Or, but it, and we also have a dust disk, our own zodiacal dust disk. So we should at least be able to find the structures to meaningfully argue about the same structures being generated at other places. So measuring dust is not only good for or teaches a lot about our own solar system, but maybe even solar systems in around other stars. And how can you tell uh, if, you're, if, if uh, New Horizons is cruising uh, out past the, the Kuiper Belt and hopefully uh, still a healthy spacecraft and you're getting hits on the dust counter? How can you tell whether uh, the dust it's, it's catching is from our solar system or from an external solar system? So it's a simple instrument. This question we cannot answer. I, ah. cannot, tell I cannot tell apart interstellar, interplanetary. It's, a, it's, a, it's a roughly a pizza tray sized tin film set of sensors. When a dust particle hits, it generates a signal. But I the detector will be confused from small, very fast, or larger, smaller particles. So it, is n it cannot tell you whether it's interplanetary or interstellar. Gotcha. But the good news, of course, is the interstellar flux is expected to be uniform throughout the solar system. I don't expect the interstellar flux to go up as I move out away from the sun. But the interplanetary dust, the dust is that is produced by the Kuiper belt, is certainly has a strong spatial dependence. So if we see something rapidly increasing, that must be due to uh, or rapidly decreasing or changing in, 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 in time. That is, most, that is most likely due to interplanetary or dust that is produced within our own solar system as opposed to dust that comes in at very high speeds. I see. Uh, that's, that's very interesting and we'll look forward to uh, staying in touch with the, uh, with the New Horizons mission as it approaches Pluto here in the next couple of years and, uh, and then heads on out into the Kuiper Belt. It sounds very exciting uh, to what it might continue to find out there. Um, so I wanted to talk uh, a little bit with you. Um, uh, go back in time in the space program. And <laughs> yes. Talk, and, uh, to the moon. About, yes, yes. Uh, so let, let's talk about Apollo and Surveyor. Um, so... Uh, for, the, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Surveyor was our early uh, series of uncrewed lunar landers. Uh, they were designed to study the moon in preparation for the Apollo landings in the 1960s uh, and early 1970s. Um, but uh, when Surveyor went around the back of the moon uh, to where the moon was partially obscuring its view of the sun, um, it went to look... Uh, kind of the crescent of light coming around the side of the moon, and it saw something 
very unusual, uh, and that would later be seen throughout the Apollo program. So I'm going to see if I can, and we're going to cross our fingers for no more technical, technical problems here, but I'm going to attempt to show this image here. Let's see if we can do it without uh, uh, anything exploding. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so so, so perhaps, uh, Mihai, you can explain kind of what we're seeing here. So these, these are actually images from the, on, a, on a TV camera that was landed on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, the camera is positioned towards the vest. The solar disk, the, the, the camera was taking images during the day as well as at night, or at least uh, shortly after sunset. When these images were taken, the sun is already behind the horizon. There is no direct sunlight that would, uh, that would get into the camera. And then... Shortly, shortly after, after the sun disappears on, uh, beh behind the western horizon, the images show these bright clouds. And you notice that these images are just a couple of minutes or hours apart and this cloud exists. And if you compare these images to the images that were taken during the day, at least in some parts, when you see a little uh, bump up and down, those are big rocks on the surface. Mm. So it kind of follows the topography uh, of the surface. Very interesting. And then people argued, you know, it is forward scattered sunlight from kind of a glint from the surface. The geometry would be very difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. People argue that it has to do with the collapsing sodium atmosphere or some sort of a ga gas scattering light forward. The scale height that you are looking at seems that it's only a couple, within a few meters above the surface. Uh -huh. So it would be really hard to, to have a scale height that would give you such a sharp brightness profile if it's something like an atmosphere with a typical scale height, typical distance when things change significantly of many, many kilometers. Mm -hmm. So then people argue that, you know, it's dust. And then from the geometry and the light scattering, obser the observations in, in, in the images, they came to the conclusion that it is probably several micron-sized particles, 5, 10 micron uh, in, in, in radius, and they are somehow magically lofted above the lunar surface. <laughs> magically lofted above, I love that. <laughs> uh, the magic is actually is right because the amount of charge and the electric field that you would need to pick up such big particles, big of course is relative, but five micron in this business would be huge, mm -hmm. are enormous. And I don't have a good piece of physics to tell you how could it possibly go on on the lunar surface. Mm -hmm. but, I, but this piece of observations with many other pieces that on their own, none of them would stand up. I don't have a good explanation for either one of them other than put it together, the, assemble of these, the assembly of these observations all somehow point to the fact to some interesting plasma physics. Interesting. So the question uh, at the time kind of went unresolved um, and then it was uh, the same phenomenon was were seen again by the Apollo astronauts. Uh, is that correct? Yes. So similar phenomena was observed at much higher altitudes mm -hmm. by uh, uh, the guy who stayed in, in orbit, Cernan, actually made these yeah. famous sketches. Let me, uh, let me pull up his sketches here, see if we can share that with our audience here. Screen share. Here we go. And share. There we go. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so on the left is are the sketches, and if you look closely, in handwriting it says T minus six, T minus five, T minus two. That is before the sunrise terminator. So they they are coming from the shadow, and they are approaching local sunrise, mm -hmm. and those markings are a couple minutes out before the sun would directly be in the field of view. And there are several interesting things. T minus 6, you see this kind of a one single hump, it's a Gaussian kind of a profile. And then as you 
approach the, the sunrise, T minus 5, you notice that that bump is increasing and it, it, there are these new wings, little, uh, the brightness that kind of follows the surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. And then you get even closer, 10 to minus 2. You, in addition to the, the wings and the bright hump, you notice these straight lines, mm -hmm. bright streamers, as they as they called. And uh, the bright streamers, I, I'm sure it happened to you that Sunday you, you stay in bed for a little longer and the sun is shining into your room and you notice the amount of little spec speckles of dust really bright floating in your room. Mm -hmm. Or some of you went to school, <laughs> maybe some of your listeners went to school when we still use chalk. <laughs> <laughs> Some chalk dust and, that. and view graph projectors. And the view graph projector, if you were sitting in front and the light went through the chalk dust, it was very bright. And the back of the room who was behind didn't see much. Uh -huh. So small dust is very, when the dust size is comparable to the wavelengths, half a micron or so, visible wavelengths, then it becomes very bright. It strongly forward scatters. Mm -hmm. So people argue that these streamers are really specks of dust all of a sudden very strongly forward scattering. Uh -huh. So now let, let's look at the other pieces, the, 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 this the simple hump. That I think we all agree, or most people agree, that's zodiacal dust, dust between the orbit of the Earth and closer to the sun. So yeah. let me let me show you uh, show our viewers a picture of zodiacal dust. Um, I have a, an Earth-based picture actually of it. Okay. Let's pull that up here. Okay. Yes. <laughs> oh, it went away. It ran <laughs> away from me. Short-lived dust. Short-lived dust. <laughs> Try that one more time. Share. There we go. So. Yeah, this photo um, was taken by our friend uh, uh, Bob King, who runs an excellent uh, blog called Astro Bob. Um, he was actually at the LASP conference. Um, and in this photo here is uh, Jupiter and Venus. And uh, so I think this is a great illustration because the dust is kind of lying uh, with the ecliptic. Absolutely, uh, yes. And, and this is what you're talking about with the... This, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So between us and the sun, of course, the Orion dust cloud, the zodiacal dust, is produced by it's a collisional debris migrating towards the sun, generated perhaps in the asteroid belt or maybe even in the Kuiper belt. Active comets, all the dust produced in throughout the solar system due to what we call pointing Robertson drag is slowly migrating towards the sun and eventually will end up in the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if we were to go back to the previous image. Yes. The one that the that uh, the Cernan did mm -hmm. that catch, so that the big single hump is more or less what you expect for the geometry, as you would see from coming around on the night side of the moon. So mm -hmm. that that kind of a shape is really forward scattered light, solar radiation that is forward scattering on zodiacal dust. Mm -hmm. But that shape. Is, has nothing to do with the moon, so it's kind of weird that as you come closer, like T minus 5 or, or T minus 1, there is this brightness that follows the surface. Those wings left and right from the big hump uh -huh. somehow makes no sense if it's zodiacal dust. If it would be lunar dust, dust that lofted from the surface of the moon and settling back down on ballistic orbit, maybe reaching heights of a couple tens, maybe hundreds of kilometers, that, this is how you would then scatter the light on that dust. That would, that would be kind of a telltale sign of lunar dust. Mm -hmm. Is this the only explanation? No. But again, this is yet another piece of the puzzle that seems that dust moving around the surface, maybe even reaching high altitudes is, is, is a real process. It's really going on on the lunar surface. So it sounds... Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, the one to the right is, is a much later image. That's Clementine. You might recall that was a, a, a cheaper, faster, better. There was a, there was a small mission that, that orbited the moon. And that is an image that is done in somewhat a similar geometry than the Apollo sketches. You are... The spacecraft is in darkness. You see the surface of the moon 
due to reflected light from the Earth. That's Earthshine. The sun in this image is behind, behind the moon. And you more or less, I try to mark up the, the blue and the red parts of the brightness. The red is kind of follows the surface that possibly has to do with, uh, with lunar dust. And then the blue, which is, I just mark up the light that is forward scattered from the zodiacal dust cloud. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think, I, I'm not 100% sure, the bright dot, of course, is Venus in the image. Sounds reasonable, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll call it Venus. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's fascinating that we have, so we have two different views of lunar dust at this point. We have Surveyor seeing a very low line, perhaps in the just uh, a couple of meters above the surface, and then we also have this phenomena uh, seen by the Apollo astronauts um, where it's arcing much, much higher above the surface. And, and that one, uh, from what I've read, was not always um, constant, correct? Sometimes they'd see yes. it, sometimes they would not? Uh, that, is a, that is correct. So it is, it is, it is time-dependent, controversial. Maybe it has to do how much dark adopted uh, Eyes, the uh, 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 the astronaut was willing to to sit in dark and be patient. I I, I don't know, and so I have to add, okay. we also had a surface measurement. We had an instrument left behind by Apollo 17, that after the astronauts returned safely returned, came back to the Earth, the instrument this instrument started to work and made dust measurements. That's LEAM, lunar ejecta and meteorite experiment. It was meant to measure the high-speed impact of interplanetary dust reaching the, the, the surface of the moon. And instead, it measured something entirely different. Every sunrise and sunset, the fluxes it measured went 100-fold up. And people had other arguments that it's not dust, it's overheating or, or noise in the electronics. But at the end of the day, perhaps the most reasonable suggestion that it did measure instead of high-speed small particles, it measured large, slow-moving, highly charged particles. That is lunar soil movement. Uh, again, I don't know how it ha happened, but, but there, was a there was quite a bit of interest, of course, at the time. This is back into the, to the mid-70s. Uh, there were lab models, there were experiments, there were uh, theoretical models that indeed you could fool this instrument and slow moving highly charged dust can make a signal that would record as it was recorded. <laughs> so the instrument might have detected that but again I'm at a loss how to lift off really li large particles that would carry maybe on the order of a million <laughs> mi missing or extra electrons to, to give you the signals that uh, this instrument recorded. So, so let's talk about that on how how the, the levitating dust happens. I mean, you were talking about the, the higher uh, density particles, or maybe I had that wrong, but um, how does the, how does the uh, low level moon dust uh, levitate? How does, how does that happen? So parts of it, I can give you good physics. And other parts of the problem, we are still at a loss. And I have to fess up, I don't quite know how it works. But let's start with the easy part. Okay. How, how, can you, how can you beat gravity uh, on a surface in a plasma? And then the other part is how you actually get particles off the surface. Uh, I have to rely on more hand waving and more, <laughs> more rapid hand waving. And then a miracle happens, as they say. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the description I would like to offer, of course, is, is, is small laboratory experiments that we could do here on Earth there is no way we could reproduce the lunar conditions. But the good news about physics, that the equations hopefully hold regardless where you apply them. And if we can capture our understanding how this works on, in the lab, then we can maybe meaningfully argue how it will work on, on, on the lunar surface. Mm -hmm. So I imagine in the lab that we just put a, in a box a surface with a lot of electrons and ions above it. They will run to the surface and they will charge it. Electrons are much more mobile because even if they had the same temperature as, if electrons and ions have the same temperature, the ion 
mass is so much larger than the electron mass, 2,000 times heavier, that the flux of electrons is, is, is much, much more than the flux of ions. Uh, you, <laughs> okay, now you are, that, that's a more complicated setup, but <laughs> could, the sonority has a magnetic field. But even if you go back uh, to an earlier side, so in a plasma, the surface itself, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think you should uh, go the other direction in this. Other present. direction, okay. I didn't mean to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, <laughs> it's just good. Where you were going? Uh, more. Yeah, keep, keep going. I think. Keep going. Keep going. One. Here we are. This so one. Now go back. Or oh, this is good. This is good. This are. One of these is fine. So imagine okay. <laughs> that this is the experiment we're gonna do. On, on the bottom left shows a, a standard plasma chamber. There is a pizza tray with fine dust, and we put this, we generate electrons and ions in, in, inside the chamber. Electrons running to the pizza tray will charge it negative, and if you charge negative, of course, that would happen that the further electron flux to the, to the pizza tray is slowed down, because electrons don't like to meet up with other electrons. There's a repulsive force. And the ions are encouraged to balance and make equal number of electrons and ions coming to the surface. Mm -hmm. So there, right above the surface, there is an overabundance of ions. So imagine then the surface itself is negatively charged, and there is a bunch of ions above the surface. And if you move further away, then of course there is more or less equal number of electrons and ions as you move away from the pizza tray. So the magic in this experiment happens with a hammer. <laughs> if you look closely, there's a little mechanical device that we kick the pizza tray. The dust goes flying, and some of them, some of the dust particles with a small negative charge fly above the region where there is too many ions. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there is an electric field that is supporting, possibly can support those brains against gravity. So on the right, actually this is an image, the, the little bright dots are dust particles dancing above the, the pizza tray, beating gravity in the laboratory. <laughs> you also notice that very close to the pizza tray, there is no dust. Very close to the pizza tray, the dust will have an, a different sign of charge. It will positively charge. There's an overabundance of ions in that region. And then they are attracted to the surface. So there is, you have to be above a certain distance, then you can safely stay there. And all particles that would try to find a place closer to the pizza tray will never make it. They will immediately fall down. So some of this physics, I think, has to do with the surveyor images, that yes, you can beat gravity. Yes, you can levitate dust. The first step is difficult. Coming off the surface is hard, because you are at, you are, there is cohesive and forces between the dust particles and the charges we are talking about, at least naively, based on, on calculations, are just insufficient to lift you. But once you get off the surface, it's a, it's, it's a whole different bargain. It's so a lot easier. It's a lot easier. So maybe what happens that this has to do with, uh, you know, these are impact generated uh, secondary particles, meteorites, bombardment would love particles, maybe that's the hammer on the moon, and some mm -hmm. of them would find its place and ki kind of float above the surface. Mm -hmm. Roughly one, what we call the Dubai length, one, one scale height above the uh, surface where the, charge is, the sign of charge is the same as the sign of charge on the surface itself. Mm -hmm. So the electric force on these grains is up, and they can balance gravity, just like they do it in, in the laboratory. And, and so, <clears throat> speaking of the laboratory, so um, you, there's, there's a couple ways that you can kind of study these phenomena. One, of course, um, we can talk about is a spacecraft that's going to go to the moon and check this out firsthand uh, next year. But uh, I wanted to talk first, if we could, a little about the dust accelerator that you have at the, uh, at the UCB um, the lab for atmospheric and space physics. Um, yes. So, um, pull up a picture of it here and show everyone what we're talking about. 
and there are several amazing pictures here. But let me let me grab one. Screen share. Okay. And, oh, went away. Let me try again. Share. Share. Okay. Yes. So there's one of your students, I assume. Um, yes. Or former student. <laughs> okay. So maybe uh, you could tell us just a little bit about what the dust accelerator does, um, what it, how it, how it works, just kind of a high high level overview, and, and what kind of things uh, it hopes to solve. All right. So there are many reasons that we are interested. What happens when a high speed small dust particle hits a surface? Maybe you are worried about uh, the long-term performance of the James Webb telescope, the mirrors. Maybe you are worried about uh, thermal blankets, the damage that meteorites can do to thermal blankets, or just the physics of what happens when matter is compressed to really high high pressures. So this is uh, you you could certainly use a rifle and have high-speed impacts. Typically, it will go four, five, maybe even six kilometers per sec. Uh, you could do what's called a plasma drag accelerator. You could do uh, explosives. But the nicest, cleanest way to do these measurements is, a, is, is an electrostatic dust accelerator you could reach much higher speeds, up to maybe even 100 kilometers per sec. But the particles that, that you can get to those speeds are typically very small. Micron, submicron, 10 to minus 12, 10 to minus 14, 10 to minus 15 kilograms. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that uh, most space dust that you are interested in is in this size range. So for space physics, for space applications, this would be this is, this is a good device. And the heart of this device is, first of all, you need to generate 3 million volt potential difference. You, could, you might remember from Freshman 101, probably you, ha you have seen a, a Van de Graaff, a belt-driven, a mechanical, mechanically charged separating device that moves uh, electrons from one side, one, one side to the other. We have a version of that. It's called a Pelatron. It was uh, done, built here in, in the US, uh, National Electrostatic Corporation. Um, it's a beautiful device. It can generate a 3 million volt potential difference between uh, the two ends of the machine. In the previous plot, you have seen this big tank. The big tank actually is, is a pressure tank. There are six atmospheres of sulfur hexafluoride. It's a gas that is filling the tank that is very electron affin. So any free electrons in the system would immediately be attached to one of these molecules other than making an avalanche and the discharge that would ruin our electronics. Mm -hmm. uh, in, inside that high pressure region, there is, a, there, is a, there is a tube that is roughly, oh, maybe four or five inches across that is at 10 to the minus 6 atmospheric pressures, is highly evacuated. And then one end of it is a tiny dust accelerator that is, lives inside the big accelerator. The way it works is, imagine a little uh, dust reservoir, a little box containing dust, maybe a cubic centimeter in, in size. Uh, mm -hmm. A high voltage needle is reaching into it. And the high voltages, like 25 kilovolts worth of high voltage, is being pulsed. So the dust particles float around, once in a while get into contact with this high voltage needle, and they move out from the small dust accelerator to the big accelerator and fly through a voltage drop that is 3 million volts. 3 million volts. <laughs> 3 million, up to 3.3 .3 million volts from the top end to the bottom end. And the electric field is... Uh, from the wall, down, down the pipes, so we accelerate positively charged particles. The reason is to beat what's called the field emission limit. It's much higher, much easier to keep large charges, large positive charges on small objects than 
negative, uh, uh, negative charges. So the, the process itself is, is kind of random. How much charges you're going to get, how big of a particle is coming out of the accelerator, that we have little control over, other than, of course, you know what is the size distribution of the dust that you, that you are using. So what we do then is we do very precise dust selection. We measure the speed and the charge multiple times in, in, in the pipe, and then very quickly, in, in, in a few microseconds, we make a decision whether this is the speed and the mass of the particle you want to do an experiment with. And if that's the case, then we let the particle go into, into an experimental chamber. Hmm. And then, for example, if you want to, to know how much damage a certain mass and speed particle is causing, you could, you could go through and step through the speed, the various speed ranges and various mass ranges. Or if you want to calibrate and test an instrument that will go into space, like the dust instrument on LDEX, we can look and identify the signals, how they look at the accelerator for a certain speed and certain mass. And then we get the report back from space, how a signal looks. I can then report back to you what was the mass and speed uh, that the detector was uh, hit by in, in, in space. So that's what we call calibration and test of, uh -huh. of, of the instrument. And I just wanted to show our viewers a picture I had here of um, an example of what kind of damage we can be talking about. I'm sure everyone's heard about the problems with space junk. This was a, uh, a um, looks like less than a one millimeter particle uh, this struck the window of the space shuttle um, Challenger during STS-7. That was actually um, Sally Ride's first flight into space. Uh, oh, my goodness. And that yes. was the uh, damage resulting from it. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of why it's important to uh, uh, study <laughs> the type of impact and, uh, you know, that these, these tiny particles can have. Yeah. Um, so another way that, uh, that you can study um, the lunar dust environment, and uh, you alluded to it there, uh, you could use the dust accelerator, and you have used it to calibrate um, the LDEX instrument, which is going to be on an upcoming NASA mission, actually. Um, and that would be LADY, the Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer. So maybe you could um, just kind of tell us a little bit about that spacecraft and w what it's going to be looking at up there. Okay. So, before we return to the moon, and of course, I have no doubt in my mind, eventually that will happen, <laughs> that there is a desire to, to really learn about the pristine environment. And pristine, of course, we, we have already landed multiple times, but nevertheless, it didn't happen for a long time. And it would be nice to study the atmosphere, the dust environment, so we can then come to meaningful conclusion how these things might work at other objects throughout the solar system that are much harder to, to visit than the moon. The moon is only a couple of days out, so it's easy to get to. It's much easier to make these measurements at, at the moon than it is at an asteroid or Phobos or Deimos or even Mercury. Yeah, it was such, such an incredible challenge to get in orbit about Mercury and make measurements there. Are you so making measurements at Mercury on Messenger? The Messenger does not have a dust detector. But it, uh, but it has UV instruments, ultraviolet instruments, that could possibly notice uh, similar issues. It can certainly identify the dilute atmosphere of mercury, the composition of it, and also possibly the fine dust particles that are, m just like the moon, must be around mercury as well. Yeah, there mercury, someone, yeah. <laughs> mercury is bombarded at all times, just like the moon. In fact, it's hit by much higher speeds because these particles are moving much faster, closer to the sun, just like that's Kepler's law. Mm -hmm. So the, the relative speeds are much higher there. So I think everything that we are studying at the moon would certainly apply at, at Mercury, at Mercury as well. Mm -hmm. So LADI will have three, three instruments, and they are in, in, in actually they are all of them ready to be to be put on the spacecraft. Uh, and at the bottom, that big box is a neutral mass spectrometer that would analyze the neutral gas entering a small hole and will tell you the composition very precisely. It will tell you the comp it, will, it will identify argon versus 
uh, whatever gaseous species you, you could look for, oxygen, sulfur, all, all, all the candidates. And as the spacecraft goes around and, and around the moon, it will make a map in space and time. How the lunar atmosphere is evolving around the moon, how much more volatiles are released from the surface during the day, how, how those collapse during the night. So the neutron mass spectrometer will actually make a direct measurement of the lunar atmosphere. Yeah, interesting. Uh, the, back, the, the little gold box that is pointing up in your image, that's an ultraviolet imager that will make the measurements at short wavelengths. Is uh, this box? The, no, no, the, 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 the two other instruments are on the top deck. Ah, okay. And the one that is on, on the right side, the top right, yes, mm -hmm. that's the ultraviolet instrument. And as a function of wavelengths, it will see the amount of brightness or attenuation of the solar radiation. And then we can invert those measurements and get some feel about how much gas and how much uh, dust particles are uh, above the surface. It's kind of a remote sensing measurement of of the atmosphere and the fine dust. The other two instruments, the neutron mass spectrometer and the dust instrument, the third one, are, are in situ measurements. Mm. But, the, but the UV imager would, would be very important to, to give you kind of the, the whole field of view, the global content, and then, of course, the in situ measurements will fill up the picture with fine details. And then hopefully those two reports will match. <laughs> and we can build models that are that are consistent simultaneously with the UV measurements and then the dust instrument measurements. So the third box is the one, is the roundabout little thingy that is pointing just above the neutral ma mass spectrometer. That's the dust instrument. Mm -hmm. and on this image, the cover is on, but it's kind of, it's a hem <laughs> it has the dust particles will enter a hemispherical target. Uh -huh. And those signals then can be used to tell you about, in some cases, the charge, certainly the mass, and most cases also the speed. In most cases, the speed would be just the relative speed of the spacecraft and its environment, about 1.6, 1.7 kilometers per sec. Uh, but we could certainly tell you about the, the, the amount of dust and the size distribution of the dust that the spacecraft would fly through. So I was reading the um, uh, the mission objectives for this, and uh, I really found it fascinating that Objective 2 says, determine if the Apollo astronaut sightings of diffuse emission at tens of kilometers above the surface were sodium glow or dust. So <laughs> can you explain that one a little bit better? I, first of all, it's fascinating that the phrase Apollo astronauts is in the mission objective. I think that's very neat that we're still trying to learn from Apollo. Um, so what, what exactly are they trying to figure out there? What's the difference between sodium glow and dust? So the sodium, of course, is the atmosphere. That's gas. Sodium is special, not because we believe that the entire lunar atmosphere is made out of sodium, but sodium has what's called a resonant line. It scatters the solar radiation very efficiently, so it's very bright. Um, the issue, whether it's dust or sodium, as as we had we talked about it earlier, it, it's an open issue since the Apollo astronaut reports and mm -hmm. the LEAM, the surface measurements, the surveyor measurements, and I think that's exactly what science should do. Eventually, close outstanding issues. We can argue and argue and argue, <laughs> but I think without new input, it's, it becomes circular. Yeah, yes. we, we've heard these arguments. We, we, we went through for the last 25, 30 years. I have no new piece of information to, to conclude. It will not happen without something that would break the, the gridlock, have new data, have measurements that can then resolve these issues. Mm -hmm. If the dust detector will remain silent and sees no dust at all, and the UV instrument would see the similar brightness uh, in sodium lines, of course, the astronauts cannot distinguish half a micron or, 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 or a quarter micron. It's, it's really hard. But if you have a dedicated instrument, then you could make the measurement and identify the composition of the lunar atmosphere. 
if the dust detector is, is ticking and reports hits, then it, it, it sees dust. So I don't think we, this will be the last issue about how dust gets lofted or move, moves around on the surface. But if we do see dust, then it is certainly would indicate the type of measurements, the type of inquiries that you should do once, we can, once you can get to the surface. If you see no dust at all, then the arguments for dedicated dust instruments maybe is not so strong. And of course, you know, every mission, there are the resources. As I'm talking about not only money, but power and mass and data rates. Everything is very, it's, it's very precious. So every, every instrument that, is, that gets on a spacecraft has to have a well-defined role that, that will bring something to closure possibly answer an outstanding question. So I think the combination of these instruments, the neutral mass spectrometer, the UV, and the dust, I think it will bring closure to this issue, whether the astronaut sightings, the lean measurements, the surveyor images, that can be possibly dust or it's all atmosphere. And then we can think about what's next. What would be the next set of logical measurements to make, either in orbit or on surface, to follow it up further. But I, I, I think at, at least, you know, I, I don't think a, a ever we have the last word of, of, uh, on anything in physics. I'm sure this is the, not the last word. But at least it will, it will bring closure to, to some of these issues. Sure. Are, are we to worry about it? Is this something that is relevant throughout the solar system? Should we invest to more dedicated instruments to be in orbit? Should we land? If you do land, what exactly should you measure? So I, I think this is, this is kind of a, an in-between step before, before you invest more. Uh, and it's a logical step to, to, to make sure that what you do next is really the best possible way to follow the thread of, of, of these issues. Yeah. And Lady is expected to launch uh, May 2013, is that correct? Uh, it's a little oh. later, September 2013. September 2013, okay. <laughs> and it's, it's a very short mission. Uh, it will get to the moon, will get into orbit within a month or so. We have 100 days to make science measurements, and then the mission is over. Hmm. It, will, it will scan the region between maybe down to 20 to a couple hundred kilometer height. So the, I think it's, it's going to do well. It's the, the instrument suite, the, the logic, how the measurements are laid out, how the measurements will be performed, mm -hmm. will, will bring what you, what you ask for. It will answer at least the limited set of, of, of uh, questions. And then, of course, it's up to our will and determination if we can follow up these problems, if we can design then the best possible next step either on the moon or, or, or in orbit or possibly on the surface. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left uh, just because we started a little late with our technical difficulties. So I just wanted to remind our viewers, if you have a question for Mihai, uh, anything about dust, the moon's surface, uh, anything you would like him to answer, just uh, ask it uh, somewhere where I can see it. That would either be in the Google Plus Hangout area um, or post a comment on YouTube or, uh, or somewhere along that. Um, but we'll keep chatting here for the last 10 minutes and I'll, I'll periodically check in to see if anybody has a question. Um, so uh, uh, one, one other thing I wanted to uh, pick your brain about was um, some of the problems that uh, dust can cause uh, on the lunar surface for future human explore exploration. Um, as you said in the beginning, um, it's kind of like being working in a coal mine, uh, dust sticking to everything. And as I understand it, you can actually get an electric potential uh, within the dust and possibly put out a good shock to damage uh, equipment? Uh, so the moon is dry, even though it has some atmosphere, possibly patches of ice in permanently shadowed regions. I if, you, if you live in Boulder, uh, or, or some other dry parts of the country, you certainly know when you wiggle it around on the carpet and then you touch the doorknob, there is an unpleasant little zip. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you are safe. You will not be electrocuted. Uh, we hope the current, not. The amount of charge that you move across, the current is very small. But 
you see with the advance of, of computers and electronics, things are packed and vulnerable that, that sinks are now so efficient and so tiny that these discharges are, are a bigger and bigger hazard because you, you, you destroy something within your tiny chip and then all of a sudden that's a thousand, uh, uh, a thousand pieces, a thousand little transistors all of a sudden are kaput. When the, the, the 60s technology, sinks were huge. Yeah? We used bulbs, we used transistors that are as big as my nail. So things were much more robust and, and their sensitivity to these discharges are were much less than I expect or modern devices will have that we're going to carry back to the moon in, in years to come. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we have to worry about electrocuting an astronaut, but I do believe that uh, little shocks, little, if, you, if you work in a lab and you touch high, the, the, a chip, you never do that without grounding your, without wearing a, a, a wrist ground mm -hmm. for exactly this reason. And it's very hard to find ground on the moon. Yeah, there is no, yeah. <laughs> there is no, uh, I, I'm just joking, but it, it is really difficult to have, a, what exactly are you grounding to? What, what, what exactly is this big uh, rod going into so that you could ground and, and protect your devices? So I expect with, with modern electronics, it's a much bigger issue than it, it, it used to be. Do you know of any um, proposed solutions to prevent things like that from happening? Or are we so far away from uh, putting, you know, re, uh, sending people back to the moon that um, that question hasn't really been considered in depth? So I, I am, I, I'm sure this is, this, is, uh, this is something that big NASA centers would, would look into uh, at a small university group. Uh, we could certainly look into the basic physics, have, have uh, just, just small exploratory laboratory experiments and make contributions to possibly find out the interesting physics questions that, you know, then can be used in, into large-scale engineering and, and uh, really inventing or investing into, into the most appropriate uh, protective uh, technologies or uh, find out how to do this best. That, that is a much bigger scale problem that we can, we can do here in, in our lab. But we could certainly do the small experiments. We can certainly do tri uh, dust, dust collisions, uh, moving surfaces, try to remove small dust particles that are not directly leading to, to a mitigation technology, but along the way they, used to, they should be helpful. But I'm sure at Kennedy or at Glenn Research Center there are groups uh, that are worried about these things day and night, and I'm sure they have their own <laughs> uh, <laughs> approaches. People are working around the clock to solve this problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question here from uh, one of our commenters, um, from Paul Gracie. He asks, could it be said that the solar system is traveling through relatively static interstellar dust? That is to say, static with regard to the mass of the Milky Way, or is this dust coming from all directions? Interesting oh, question. Th that is a beautiful question. And in fact, we know the answer. We, uh, uh, that is due to Ulysses. Ulysses was a spacecraft that went out of the ecliptic plane and, and made the first time measurements of, uh, of, of plasma and field measurements above the poles of the sun. So there is an interesting story I'm not sure we have time to go through, but you know, it was supposedly go from the shuttle and due to the shuttle disaster, it had a, a six year delay. It was a long delay for the Ulysses launch. And uh, to get out of the ecliptic plane, the only way to do that is fly by Jupiter and have a gravity assist that would actually torque your orbit. So when you fly from the ecliptic plane, all of a sudden you take an almost 90 degree turn and you have then an orbital plane that is fixed by the position of Jupiter. This would be something like uh, Voyager 1 when it uh, left the solar system, right? Th that's right. There the gravity assist was to gain energy. Here the gravity assist was to change the orbital plane. Mm -hmm. Now this new orbital plane happened to be almost 90 degrees in the direction of the motion of, of, our, of our solar system. Mm -hmm. So this is the direction where the interstellar gas is flowing through the solar system. If without the so this is a tiny, tiny silver lining, of course. 
but if, if it was launched in time, the measurement plane would have been that the dust and the gas would be flying in the plane and we would never notice interstellar dust flying through the solar system. Mm -hmm. But UNISYS had a dust detector. It observed incredible things. First of all, believe it or not, Jupiter is a source of dust. High-speed tiny particles are flying away from Jupiter. That was a Ulysses discovery. And the second discovery is once you go into orbit and, and make these measurements in this plane, which is normal to, to the flow of interstellar gas, hydrogen and helium, the dust detector lit up and it noticed a beam of dust, almost like a very well-focused or a directed beam, small dust particles entrained in the gas flow coming with a very similar speed from a very similar direction as, interplanetary, as, as the interstellar gas. So that these dust particles can be identified due to their very high speed. They are coming at speeds that are much above the escape speed at 5 AU, that's the, or, or where the spacecraft is. They're coming at 26, 27 kilometers per second. So they are not from our, our own solar system, and they are coming from a very precise direction. And as far as Ulysses goes, so it appears that about a third of the dust hits were due to interstellar, interstellar dust. Mm -hmm. So now this is back to the initial discussion. Imagine that now, based on this knowledge, you would say, I know that interstellar dust is coming. I can now have a better measurement in addition to just the mass and the speed. I want to know the composition. So now you could argue that in the next mission, with similar characteristics in orbit as Ulysses, you could fly a dust instrument that would measure isotopic and chemical composition. And then you have the ability to tell apart interstellar and interplanetary dust. And that would be an incredible science breakthrough. Yes. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll get the funding for that and uh, you'll be the PI on that mission. <laughs> uh, or some of my younger colleagues. It takes okay. time, but uh, I, 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 I'm all for it. I think that would be that would be incredible. Yes. So you know, Stardust had the, the aerogel collectors, and for years it was pointing in the right direction to catch interstellar dust, and that search in in the return sample is still ongoing. It's very hard to identify and find the specks of dust, submicron, 0.3 micron dust particles in the aerogel. So maybe we do have interstellar dust that we can identify, but it's really hard. Hmm. This measurement would be much easier done in situ, have five, six years of exposure, analyze in situ, analyze on board on the spacecraft, and send back the, the knowledge. Uh, that might be a much cheaper way to go. And then, or maybe combine it with a sample return. I, I think that has its own tremendous advantages, mm -hmm. and of course, cost as well. But yes, dust is a messenger. Be, be on the surface of the moon, coming from interstellar space, there's a lot. There's a lot to learn. <laughs> well, I will leave it at that then. Yes, there is there's a, uh, a lot still to learn, and it's, it's really a, a fascinating topic, um, a surprisingly fascinating topic, all the things that you can learn about, uh, about interstellar dust. Um, so thank you, Mihai, so much for uh, sitting through the technical difficulties. I'm so sorry we had trouble uh, getting it started there. Um, <laughs> I'll do better next time, I hope. <laughs> Jason, thank you. <laughs> Good, th thank, yeah. you for, thank you for this opportunity. Yes, Talk thank you that. very much. Um, just to recap, um, Mihai is uh, he's a scientist at the University of Colorado Boulder's Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. Uh, he's also the principal investigator at the Colorado Center for Lunar Dust and Atmospheric Studies, which runs the Dust Accelerator. So thank you once again, and uh, it was a great chat. Look forward to talking to you again sometime. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye.